Would you like to learn to tango, Donna? I'm offering you my services, free of charge. What do you say? Uh, I think I'd be a little afraid. Afraid of making a mistake. No mistakes in the tango, Donna. Not like life. We try it? All right, I'll give it a try. John here, guys, and today we're talking about the TBS Tango 2. After many, many, many iterations of two weeks, it is finally here. And am I the first reviewer to review it that was not sent a review copy? Possibly. Uh, but whether I got sent a review copy or not, I was definitely going to tell you all of the things that I think about this radio and every other product. Let's dive in. This is a game controller, super ergonomic feeling uh, transmitter. And I really have not been interested in Team Black Sheep's transmitters. The original Tango was a bit of a novelty. Nobody that really seriously flies, or, or I shouldn't say flies, there are very few racers that actually used the Tango 2 over the last few years. You used to see a few more of them back in 27, 20, uh, 2017, 2018. But uh, there are a lot of people that did really enjoy the large form factor, the screen in the middle. I think it actually helped a lot of newcomers get introduced. I would actually see a lot of newcomers that had a um, decent amount of budget have those radios. But um, the hobby kind of moved on. And I remember my, one of my first radios after Fly Sky, we all go through Fly Sky, right? Um, was the Turnigy Evolution. And I really, really liked that radio, but the receivers were just such garbage. It was so ergonomic. It was so close to one of these. And yes, this is a launch day Project Scorpio uh, Xbox One controller. Now, why is that notable? That's because unlike a lot of these other fake ass nerds on YouTube, I'm actually into all of this shit. So if you've been a gamer, I've been a gamer since this controller looked like an Atari stick. And so the transition from this to something more shaped like this is so much easier um, for a lot of us. Now, the people that have been in RC so long, they are used to things that look a little more like this. The Jumper T16 Pro, the most popular radio on the market today. The darling of FPV. But is the TBS Tango in a place to supplant that spot as the number one desired um, product on the market? Uh, let's go into a couple of features. First of all, it has this immortal T antenna on the top and their solution for embedding an antenna into uh, a very functional, cohesive package. This is one of the best innovations I've seen in FPV over the years. Um, this antenna is a little ungainly, a little unwieldy um, when you put it in the module on the back of your radio but they have put it in this beautiful case. It has a uh, signed um, sort of sheened uh, TBS logo on the front that really looks attractive and it folds down when not in use out of the way it folds up very easily when in use and it also doubles as a kickstand goodness 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 uh, this is just I mean just this feature alone I could just actuate it like all day um, and just marvel at how awesome it is um, they have done away with these very breakable switches. Now, I actually have never broken a switch. I'm kind of careful with my gear. Uh, maybe that comes from being a, a huge video camera nerd for the past couple of decades. Um, so that's never been a problem for me, but it is a little bit of a pain when trying to find somewhere to cart your radio around. A lot of times I throw this in my rolling case at the top and just hope that none of these break because this did not come with any sort of a case, unlike my Q7XS that did come with a case. 
So they have went with, on the outer shoulders, you have a two position button. That button stays clicked in when you click it. Uh, in the middle of that has three position sort of rocker style buttons. Um, and then on the rear, you have sort of these, they're not like trigger buttons. It's sort of in the same place that a trigger button would be here. Or no, it's actually not. It's <laughs> trigger button still on the top, right? But it's sort of like kind of where the side of, uh, on the side of where it would be. And there are single press uh, momentary type switches. I don't really know what I would use that for, but uh, I do like this. When you put your hands on the radio, um, much like a controller, where you're used to sitting your index fingers on a controller on the top, where are you used to sitting your fingers control when you put your hands on this on the top so they are right there for the buttons. You know, with this style radio, my index fingers naturally grab the hand grips. So it's, I've never been comfortable taking my index fingers to actuate switches. So on these radios, I always use, you know, the switches on the front, not on the top. Use one, two, and three. I always arm over here. So what does that mean? I always have to take my thumb off in order to disarm. Now, whenever I had the turn G evolution, the sticks were kind of on the back, more like trigger buttons, and I was always able to have the smoothest landings um, because I could put my quad in auto level mode. Uh, even I used to run really high camera angle back then and just bring the stick down and it would be perfect. With these, you know, especially with, you know, if you have over 40 degree camera angle, you're kind of looking at the sky. Um, you kind of just have to get close to the ground and disarm and tumble. And you kind of kill a lot of batteries that way. So this has really come up with an innovation that allows you to avoid all that. I could easily see myself switching myself to auto level mode to do that landing or any other variation of that. It would take me a little bit of um, getting used to for, you know, to be able to be quick on the disarm, but that wouldn't take long. And I really like that you can actuate these easily without removing your thumbs from the sticks. Um, the other thing is that it uses USB-C, USB-C, ah, yes, finally, even the jumper T16 uses the old USB mic, micro, no, my, not micro, mini, or whatever the hell it's called, this is a, f ugh. yeah, that's one of my bigger complaints with this thing, so this has remedied that, it is on the bottom, which I don't like, because when you are simming, which everybody should sim, uh, when you're simming in Velocidrone or liftoff, uh, a lot of times when they put it on the bottom, um, I don't care if you're like me, I tend to rest my radio in my lap like this, kind of against my stomach. Uh, other people that use a neck strap tend to kind of put it against their chest like this. And uh, either way, that bottom USB cable is in the way. Now the jumper remedies that by putting it on the top. I did not find it to be much of an issue with the Tango 2, however, and that's because you see how these game controller things stick out down? Your USB is recessed up in here. So yes, it's coming out of the bottom, but even if you were to put this against your chest or against your stomach, you'd still have about an inch and a half, almost two inches of clearance for that USB cable to come out comfortably. No problem. It was no problem at all, sending with this thing. Um, it does have a very tiny screen. Now, some people don't like that. Some people do like that. I am one of the people that do like that. Um, a well, giant I screen, oh, I just turned it on. A giant screen like this is gonna do a couple of things. A giant screen like this is gonna do a couple of things. It's gonna look beautiful, no doubts about that, but it's also gonna drain your battery faster. Remember when the Horus came out, had the giant color screen, and it got like 20 minutes of battery life? No, no, no. Now the jumper with the dual 18650 cells actually does get pretty good battery life, but this supposedly can, I think I, out of a jumper, out of uh, some 3000 milliamp cells, I usually get maybe seven to nine hours, I would think, maybe 10 hours. I can go a full day easily maybe two full days of racing uh, with the jumper. But with this thing, I could probably go three or four full days. Trappy said it's closer to 20 hours for the 5,000 milliamp internal battery. It is a 1S battery and it charges through this USB micro. 
no, not USB. It char and it charges through this USB C. Now, one of the things that I did for testing this radio was I did not hook up Crossfire. I do have a Crossfire receiver ready to go into a quad, but I didn't want to taint myself because I'm not a Crossfire user. I didn't want to go out and fly one of my race quads or one of my freestyle quads on Crossfire while evaluating that this radio because the magic of Crossfire could taint my opinion and make me think it's the radio. Um, I didn't want to do that because I can still run Crossfire on this. So what I did was I played several hours of sim. I got some tracks that I was very familiar with but it hadn't flown in several months so that I would know the track but my muscle memory for flying the track would not be there. And I went and within about 10 tries um, I was able to get somewhat close to my faster time. If I gave it another 10 or 20 tries, I'm pretty confident I could be out there. Let's talk about the stick throw. The stick throw is shorter than like your full size radio. It's, to me, it's pretty close to this. I feel like the jumper, I don't know. Kebab said that it's shorter. It, it doesn't feel shorter to me. It feels similar, maybe a, a, even a little bit longer on the jumper. Um, I don't like the sticks that the shipped with, the stick ends. And they're pretty much the standard sticks that all radios ship with. But I like the Team Black Sheep Honey Stick Ends. Links for description below. But uh, these, if you're a thumber, particularly feel so good on your thumbs. I had them on here, so I went ahead and switched them on here. One thing I noted, though, is that if you put the lower section that come with the Honey Stick Ends on... It makes the stick go up too high. It sticks out, it's a little bit too proud. And I don't really feel comfortable sticking that in my bag. Also, um, it would make my thumb have to go a little bit too far up. It's almost like, you know how those motorcycle chopper guys ride with the handlebars like up here? It feels like that for your thumb, right? Um, it's just too much. Uh, and the way that the jumper can get away with that is if you look at the jumper, the gimbals are recessed about 10 or 12 millimeters or maybe even more than that. So you get your thumb at the same normal height, but you have that gimbal travel. So you can have that extension on here. These gimbals are closer to the surface, the front surface of this. So it makes them stick a little bit too far up. But the solution to that is you just use the stock lower portion of the stick end and then the honey um, stick end top portion. And then it is essentially the same level um, of height as your stock. And this feels so, so good. The exterior is a very similar hard plastic to like an Xbox controller. It is um, sort of a smooth matte finish. It's very close to like the hardness and consistency of this. Um, and then on the back, this whole back sort of quadrant is sort of a, it's, it's a tough, but it's a, it's a tougher sort of soft plastic. It's not really soft like this. Uh, but it's soft and very comfortable. This this edge right here, this curved edge where your fingers just kind of naturally go, they did some research on you know where your fingers would sit naturally. And because they made this edge travel all the way from the top to the bottom, I feel like you can really accommodate comfortably a wide variety of hand sizes. Because you know people with larger hands, their pinkies are gonna rest down towards the bottom. People with smaller hands, are gonna be at the top. I've seen you know, mine are kind of in the middle. Um, so really good job on that. Okay, let's do some quick size comparisons. You see how the gimbal distance from the edges is roughly the same. Uh, I really like that. I really like that. So significantly smaller than the QX7. Here is the X9 Lite, which is smaller than that, but it is much smaller than this. You can see how the gimbals line up from the edges there. Very nice. The reigning champ, the Jumper T16. 
much much smaller see how those gimbals line up look at it's just like it could fit like almost inside it if i put this on the on the bottom look how much shorter especially with this folder down look how much smaller look how much smaller <laughs> it's significantly smaller guys uh significantly lighter and the battery life is significantly longer um let's check out this uh this comes with like the Emacs bind and fly kits, um, very similar to that size. And let's check out a couple of Xbox One remotes right here. Very similar size to that. Check that out, would fit right into your gaming cabinet. No problem at all. One of the other things that I really, really, really love is that this is the first radio that has a feature that I've wanted for many, many, many years, which is the ability to plug in and sim and have that charge your actual battery as you are simming. So as, and I really like that because that incentivizes you to keep up your simulator practice. So if you use a lot of your battery on race day and you want to go charge it, um, instead of just leaving it plugged in, which you can do, you can charge it by getting the necessary SIM hours. So it pops up just like OpenTX does. Do you want to use it as a USB joystick? Boom. And you go into um, Velocidrome, set it up as a controller, and you're ready to start simming. And as you are simming, you can see right there, the battery is charging. I was at 4.0 earlier and I've been simming for a while. It's at 4.1. That is outstanding. I really, really love that feature. I don't know if anyone's mentioned that so far. A couple of things uh, has the three buttons. These are the three um, FR Sky buttons, same as on any FR Sky radio. Then it has the jog wheel, same as any other FR Sky product. Um, it has a power button that you hold. Some people have noted it's it's less time. I think it's the same. Here's a race. Here's a race, guys. Let's hold the power button at the same time. Welcome to Jeopardy. Yeah, it's, it's like the same. It's not any faster or they're slower. So, you know, whatever. Um, your screen is a little bit small for reading. Let's, uh, I'm going to go ahead and go into some a setting that I change sometimes, which is, I'm going to cut, here's where I would go to put in a throttle cut and I can see it just fine. I mean, I can read everything on the screen. You know, it's the, where you have your outputs 100. I would just hold this edit. Now I can edit my throttle cut. That's all I need. You don't need a big screen on there. It's nice that you can have widgets and stuff on the jumper. It actually is pretty nice, um, but it's not really necessary. If you are a wing guy, you can get to um, trims. There's a special command that allow you to get to trims. They're sort of like sub trim things or whatever, but it doesn't have dedicated trim buttons. So if you're a wing or plane guy, this may not be for you. I know those guys like to do a lot of long range and this is crossfire, but you know, whatever. Now let's go to the negatives. This is crossfire only. And that is a very controversial decision. Yes, I really made a lot of commentary on my initial impressions video, but I wanted to give the positives first before I switch over to that side of the topic. I really think that this is a situation, a decision that is going to impact the number of units that this thing sells. Now, was that by design or not? Did Team Black Sheep intentionally decide to sell less radios by doing that? Or did they just not realize the state of FPV in general? Um, so in my mind, there was two possibilities. Either their battle with FR Sky was so intense that they're like, we're not including the ability to do anything else other than Crossfire on this unit. Uh, which is really bad. Now, Trappy has responded directly to some of those comments that I've posted saying that that is absolutely not the case. So let's take their word. Now, the other option, though, is that Team Black Sheep was so tone deaf to the outcries of the community 
that they didn't realize that multi-protocol module going into 2020 is a 100% um, absolute need. It is a, is a feature that we cannot do without many of us. And I'm in that category. I cannot do without it. You know, especially for me, like I fly Whoops, I fly Emacs. Emacs loves to use D8. Um, I fly toy grade stuff sometimes. And I also just have a number of quads. I mean, if you are the guy, kind of person that has two, three, you know, five inch, maybe a three inch and a couple of micros, sure, you might be able to get away with throwing Crossfire on all of those. But if you're like me that flies 20, 30, 40 different quads a year, you know, that additional cost of a $35 receiver versus a $13 receiver becomes quite immense. Also, I don't really recommend because of the price and crossfires for newcomers. And I really try to cater to the noobs and the newcomers on my channel. So I don't think that it's very noob friendly. Now, what could FR or what could what could Team Black Sheep do about that? Well, I've been begging, begging, pleading for a 5.8 uh, receiver or a less expensive 900 megahertz receiver that is crossfire and because a lot of us want to put these on whoops or other smaller crafts people are begging for a whoop board that has crossfire integrated in it but i really think um, a goal for 2020 for team black sheep should be to develop a receiver that is not long range that is a mile or less range equivalent to like the XM plus that is in the 13 to $18 range. I think that'll really get a lot of people onto crossfire. It doesn't have to have an immortal T. You can have just a little dipole, either a single or a double. It doesn't matter, uh, but do something like that. Make it easy to set up. And, uh, you know, then we can really start recommending that to newcomers. Um, so then who does this end up being for? Because, you know, you'd like to say that it's a newcomer, but I don't recommend Crossfire to newcomers. And the thing of it is, everything in FPV has gone down in price over the last 18 months or so. Flight controllers are cheaper. Motors are significantly cheaper. Frames are cheaper. Cameras are cheaper. You can get a 1200 TV line camera for $1,790 right now. You know, those deals, and that's not even on crazy deals like uh, in the FPV sales alerts group. That's just regular price for the new Razer, I think it is. Why haven't receiver costs gone down? Now, I'm not saying they should lower the cost of their current Crossfire receiver. I think that that has some technology that allows it to go several miles out. The price seems fair to me, but come up with an alternative option for people that don't need that. It's absolute overkill for many of us. I personally have a self-imposed rule where I don't like to fly beyond two to 300 yards. Crossfire is absolutely overkill for me in its current state with its current receiver options. So this is not whether Crossfire is better or worse. I absolutely believe that it is better. Um, but it's just like, is it worth the cost for my personal needs? And a lot of people out there are under those same impressions. And part of me wanted to get this radio because I wanted to know how good it felt, how... And I, and I was thinking like really hard, can I switch everything over to Crossfire and still be able to fly what I want to fly and still be able to run my channel? But my spidey sense is kind of tingling, guys. And it's like, you know, what would it cost? What would it cost? What did it cost? Everything. And so whenever I discovered that this thing was crossfire only with no module bay, no way to get multi-protocol on here. Um, the first thought I could think of was disappointed. Disappointed! And uniquely, um, Team Black Sheep managed to not only annoy non-crossfire users, they managed to <laughs> incredibly annoy crossfire users as well because the max power output of this is 250 milliwatts. 250 milliwatts. Now that is... Uh, depending on if you do super long range or if you live in a very highly populated area with a lot of Wi-Fi, you may need a, a, a larger power op output than that. Under ideal conditions, um, Team Black Sheet has put out a test. The range of this under ideal conditions is very impressive. But for those people that want that extra headroom and not have to worry about signal loss, 
I think that especially all the people that use the full size crossfire module, they're kind of left out in the cold by this offering. And because it's so compact, I don't really see much opportunity to be able to expand that. Now, one thing I want to address is that this does have a custom uh, fork of OpenTX on it. And uh, I want to take a moment to say what that really means. That is a huge accomplishment by the Team Black Sheep dev team. Um, they went kind of above and beyond by making an entire fork just to be able to integrate Crossfire into this OpenTX system. And, uh, you know, if you ever get out or thinking about getting into the IT uh, career in any industry, a lot of times um, teams are just too busy to be able to accommodate all kinds of ancillary requests. So by learning this infrastructure, by learning this ecosystem and being able to expand on it and provide your own fork to do to integrate the features that you want is something that happens out in the real world a lot too. That's a very much like something that would happen in my industry uh, if we wanted to get features into something that another team was working on but didn't have the bandwidth to be able to provide those feature integrations for us, we might have to go learn how to do that. And so I'm definitely commending everybody part of the dev team. Now, the naming for it is a little funny to me. Um, I'm just imagining, you know, Trappy and Wayne sitting around the kitchen with the patent exposure aprons on, cooking up some bacon and some quesadillas for the dev team, and they're just spitballing, right? What should we call this thing, right? It's gonna be a fork of OpenTX, but it's not gonna be able to run any other receiver other than Crossfire, right? So what's, what's more open than open, right? And I'm imagining one of the devs is like, uh, if it's less open, shouldn't we call it like, you know, restricted TX or like imprisoned TX? Uh, and then immediately they were like, you're fired. And then Trappy was like, I got it. I know what it should be called. I mean, it's like Trappy's over there drinking Pepsi Cola out of a Coca-Cola glass. Pepsi bottle? A Coca-Cola glass? I don't give a damn. They call it freedom? That's a little funny to me. Are you trolling the community with that? I don't know. Um, but regardless, it's very impressive that they have integrated this fully. Um, there is some squawking about the fact that this did not come with any way to put a neck strap, um, not to mention that it did not come with a neck strap at all. Uh, people are squawking about that. This is an M4 screw, so it's not hardware that we typically have on hand um, in this hobby. So you're either gonna have to print one. I don't think I would print it out of TPU. I think some places were printing it out of ABS. I don't know if I'd trust my radio, even though it's not particularly heavy still. Now this is the regular one, not the Pro. The only difference between those two is the Pro has the little foldy gimbals, but these gimbals don't really stick out that much, especially if you put the sort of wider um, honey sticks. I mean, it sticks out the same amount, but I don't have um, too much um, worry that these are gonna get bent up and destroyed. Now the gimbals themselves, they feel pretty smooth. The gimbal tension that is on here by default is a little stiff. Um, I actually like stiff ones. In fact, to me, the Jumper T16 is perfect, the Pro one. Now, some people say this is too stiff. This is even stiffer. But it comes with a couple of sets of alternate springs that you can put on there to be able to adjust this. Now, if people have posted that that is a pain to take this thing apart to be able to do it, but I like that they included that. The standard version comes with sort of like a like a tiny black burlap sack type thing. Um, I don't know if you'd really use that um, to carry it around, but it does come shipped with that. It does not come shipped with a USB-C cable or any other accessories other than those springs and the black sack. So final notes, 
Sadly, this is a great radio. This is the radio that I've been waiting for probably ever since entering FPV. It is very small, it is very compact, it's very easy to go. Sometimes when I just wanna to run to the park, fly a couple of packs for fun or for a review, um, you look a little crazy flying this. Uh, and it's much bigger, it's much heavier. Um, so really, do you wanna choose all the features and be able to fly all the models you want? Or do you be able to, or do you want to be able to have the portability? Um, and I just, this isn't for anybody that isn't already deep into the crossfire system or willing to dive in. Um, I don't think that is me, but I really wanted to check this out and I wish it was me guys. I wish I could jump over to that. I just can't really justify having these larger receivers that cost a lot more. Um, I can't, I, I would be happy to run some of those crossfire receivers and I'd be even happier if there was an alternative cheaper option to be able to run almost all crossfire, but there's always going to be some toy grade stuff, some, you know, some Emacs, like I said, some happy models, some Esheen, whatever, you know? And it's like, yeah, I don't recommend you go out and buy Esheen Wizard, but Sometimes their little micro models are quite good and I don't want to restrict myself being able to do it. And what I don't want to have to do is carry around two effing radios. Not gonna happen. It's just not. Um, so this kills me guys. If um, it really does, I want to be able to switch this and I can't. If it had D8, D16, I would be selling my jumper today probably. Um, I do like that this has multi-protocol. I've already used it to connect to a couple of random, weird toy grade protocols. That's pretty nice. Um, but I would be willing to give that up, even to just have D16 and D8. Or an ability to put some kind of a module on the back. If you enjoy these type of brutally honest and to the point, very direct reviews, please like and subscribe. I'm also doing a massive giveaway right now. My goal for 2020 is to give away 20 drones by the end of the year. So please subscribe in order to help me do that. Also join the FPV sales alerts group um, so that you can save on all of the FPV products, even if you don't win one of those bind and fly quads or the HDO2s that I'm giving away, you can win every day with the savings that you will yield from being a part of that group. We're about to hit 2,000 members over there. It is just growing so, so fast. Thanks to everybody in this great FPV community. Um, even though this is probably not gonna be the radio for me and it may not be for a lot of you out there, I really wanna say good job to Team Black Sheep for innovating, for incorporating a ton of features that we've always wanted and for incorporating features that no one had asked for but they had the foresight and the knowledge in order to know that those were features that would be welcomed. I think that that was a misstep not to include the multi-protocol multi module, but let's not overlook all the other advancements that we never even thought we needed um, that are just so amazing to have. If you are thinking about switching over to Crossfire, there is no better time like the present so it takes two to tango, so bust out your $200, put them down, get it on you today. I personally prefer the regular one. I don't need the folded gimbals. I don't know if the folded gimbals work with the TBS Honey Sticks, and I will not ever fly without those stick ins ever. They may work, um, so somebody just post in the comments if it does. Thanks, guys.